evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Louis, for uh, inviting me, and to Fatima as well, uh, for having me here in your home, and to all of you for coming on the eve of the London Design Festival. Um, tonight, uh, I will be speaking about sustainability and the uncanny, and I will explain what I mean by that a little bit later as I go along. This summer, uh, we acquired some of the protest material produced by Extinction Rebellion uh, for the Rapid Response Collection at the V&A. Um, for you who are unfamiliar with the Rapid Response Collection, um, this is a relatively new initiative by curators at the museum where objects are acquired in response to major moments in recent history that touch on the world of design and manufacturing. And they go on display as they enter the museum, unlike a lot of other objects that we acquire that go into our stores. Many of the acquisitions for rapid response collecting have been newsworthy either because they advance what design can do or because they reveal truths about how we live. Other recent acquisitions for rapid response have included the Xbox adaptable controller, a video game controller designed by Microsoft for people with disabilities to help make user input for video games more accessible. Another was the so-called Dwarfsligger, a small flip-back book that you read vertically, like scrolling through your smartphone. It was released to entice teenagers into reading physical books. All these objects are game changers in one way or another, and design plays a key role in giving them that status. In the case of Extinction Rebellion, which you can see here installed in the galleries in the V&A, the graphics created and the symbols used were carefully designed for high impact, and they're shared as open source designs to create uniform images for the movement. Extinction Rebellion has uh, an in-house art group made up of graphic designers, fashion designers and set designers who have created the unified protest materials and performances all of this year and last year. Reflecting on this year and in particular this summer, it feels like we live in unprecedented times. And yet the debates that we currently are having around sustainable living and our impact on the planet have taken place before. Lewis himself referred to this earlier when he said that he feels his generation somehow is responsible, but this goes further back than that. The fervor, the worry, the anger, the pressing nature of all of our actions have already happened 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And it is moments like these that the institutions, such as museums, become an important resource for accessing insights into our collective histories. A quick browse through the V&A's prints and drawings collection, for example, gives an ample evidence of society's preoccupation with the same subjects over the last 150 years. Here works express concerns for nature and our environment from the, the mid-1900s onwards. And here are just some of these works. Uh, here is an illustration from Punch offering a comment on the senseless killing of birds just to feed the vogue for feathered hats. And this is from around 18, well actually the date is 1892. And here, a poster by the National Council for Animal Welfare highlighting the problem with people robbing eggs from nests during and after the Second World War. And just after that, we have Will Man Outgrow Earth? A very timely question by Eduardo Palozzi from 1952. And this is Save Earth Now by Hapash uh, and the Collared Coat from 1967 uh, in a sort of uh, distinct psychedelic uh, uh, execution. And then we have this poster which might be more familiar to you as Richard, Richard Rauchenberg's uh, poster for, of the American Eagle for the first ever Earth Day in America. Um, the eagle there sits in the middle but is surrounded by all the damage that we do to the habitat of the eagle. Um, and this was released in 1970. Following that, we have Save Our Planet, Save Our Air uh, by George <coughs> O'Keefe. This was a particular project which Olivetti released in 1971. Uh, and here's another poster from that series by Buckminster Fuller, uh, which is Save Our Planet, uh, Save Our Cities, where you have uh, one of the distinct Bucky Fuller uh, constructions uh, hovering over the city of New York, over Manhattan. 
Um, and here is uh, the earth uh, packed into a box with the tagging Handle with Care. It's by Christian Aid from 1978. And just uh, a few years later, Help Save Our World with the news around the globe, released by WWF. Um, just a year later, another poster by WWF, Man Needs Rainforest 2, with a very cute monkey on it. And something that's uh, maybe, as an execution, uh, more, uh, more grabbing, uh, forests precede people, deserts follow. This was Oxfam from 1990. Um, the uh, Austrian artist Friedrich Hundertwasser here uh, has a survival or suicide message and then rainforests um, produced for a charity called Ecoropa from 1990. And then something that's a little bit more recent from 2013, Christian Uhlenfeldt's uh, piece for Gre uh, Greenpeace, um, which protests our use of fossil fuels, Save the Arctic, Stop Shell. Some of these posters are really gruelling images and their messages likewise. And in this context, Extinction Rebellion's imagery, imagery looks much more tame, more palatable for a wider audience which is also strength and intelligence in their campaign. You cannot help but getting swept up in it. But despite these very hard-hitting campaign posters reflecting some of the anxiety of the times in which they were produced, we stand here again in 2019 with the same worries and concerns for our well-being and for the future of the planet. And that is what I refer to in the title of this talk as the uncanny. It was the founder of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, who delved into our fear of and discomfort with the uncanny or the unheimlich in the 1919 essay of the same name. The 1990 date is significant, a period post-World War I where the places and people known as heimlich or homely are now being haunted by the einheimlich in the aftermath of that terrible uh, First World War. In the essay, Freud writes of the uncanny, a recurrence of the same situations, things and events do undoubtedly subject to certain conditions and combined with certain circumstances, awaken an uncanny feeling, which recalls that sense of helplessness sometimes experienced in dreams. So the recurrence of the same situation over and over again provokes that feeling of something being uncanny. It's fitting that Freud also recalls the helplessness that we at times feel in dreams, because I think helplessness is a word that we all can identify with in relation to our current climate crisis. So why do we find ourselves in this uncanny situation of history repeating itself, the same worries surfacing again and again, but with seemingly little action or result from action? Rather than to try and answer that question tonight, uh, I, think I, I think that will require much more time. I wondered if we instead can turn to the museum and its collections to find some answers. And that's what I'm hoping to do with you now. If the museum can provide an overview of history, can it also present solutions for what we might do differently in the future? The v &A or the South Kensington Museum has, as I think you might know, uh, its foundations in the 1851 Great Exhibition. At the point of foundation, uh, Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, um, sorry, at the point of its foundation by Prince Albert, Albert and Queen Victoria, it was regarded a new type of museum. One born with a mission to educate its visitors as buyers of manufactured goods, to drive the reform of contemporary design and to improve the quality of life for all. As such, the museum was both closely related to industry and the School of Design. Apart from a wide array of objects uh, required from that great exhibition and also by donation from the royal family, intriguingly, one of the museum's earliest collection acquisitions that's now destroyed was the collection illustrating the utilization of waste products. Sadly, I have no imagery of this, but you have to take my word for it. These collections included examples of then recent discoveries such as dyes derived from coal tar, a byproduct of the coal industry that of course was very big then. 
The collection demonstrated the profits that could be made from recycling waste, but it was also possible that the industrialists and scientists at this point in time were aware of the environmental benefits of recycling waste product. At this time, it was all too obvious to see the effects of waste on the urban and rural environment. Fashion historian Edwina Erdman, who last year curated the brilliant show Fashion from Nature at the museum, uh, wrote in the book of the same title, in the 1860s, the air and water pollution in Manchester and the surrounding towns was notorious and several studies were conducted into the composition of the urban industrial atmosphere, its potential long-term effect on health and ways to combat it, resulting in several river pollution prevention acts, especially as the rivers in this area were so, so polluted that in some parts, according to contemporary observers, the fluids looked more like ink than water. The English literature historian Mark Frost has observed that all of the modern features of ecology reflect the conditions of its genesis in the mid-19th century. Rather than merely being merely an offshoot of evolutionary science, early ecology represented the coming together of Darwinism and many other strands of thought, including anatomical science, romanticism, transcendentalism, human geography, religion and politics. Ecology is marked by wider 19th century tendency to draw together often desperate and sometimes, and sometimes conflicting ideas. That quote by Mark Frost is interesting in the context of museum making, a drawing together of often disparate and sometimes conflicting ideas, a little like a museum and its collection. A museum is rarely a harmonious whole, but a polyphony of voices, meanings and intentions. With this, it is also interesting to observe that the foundations of the museum, indeed all museums, not just the V&A, coincides with a more modern awareness of the human's impact on the world following the ramped up production pace and increased consumption promoted by the Industrial Revolution. While we alter the world outside of the museum's doors to beyond recognition and with devastating effects on planetary health, we collect those traces of what what, what, the world, what the world used to look like and restore it and protect it in the museum for posterity. So what does the museum collection teach us about how we can use this moment to reconsider the way we live, the way we produce, the way we consume? We are some participants of Create Voice, a brilliant initiative by the VNA where we invite 16 to 24 year olds to learn from and contribute to the museum's various processes. We asked them what would they collect to represent this current moment in time. Their answers reflected an, an anxiety that was very sobering. They suggested to collect ephemera related to birth strikers, a young generation of wom women refusing to have children, objects representing the unrealistic pressures imposed by new technology, and objects related to the current climate emergency. But what about the objects that are already in the museum? What lessons can they offer us? And how can we look at them to help us find some certainty in an uncertain future? I have here pulled up an image of a Parkesine comb. Uh, this comb is from the 1870s. And it's made from Parkesine, which is a plastic based on a liquid solution of nitrocellulose and it was invented by Alexander pa uh, Parks in the 1860s here in London. The Parkinson Company was actually in fact founded in Hackney Wick in East London in 1866, but sadly went into liquidation, no pun intended, in 1868. However, it went into liquidation not without opening the floodgates of this new and wondrous material. This is what Alexander Parks wrote of it when he presented uh, the new material uh, to the Society of Arts in 1865. The applications of this material to manufacturers appear almost unlimited, for it will be available for spinners' rolls and bosses, for pressing rolls and dyeing and printing works, embossing rolls, knife handles, combs, brush backs, shoe soles, floor cloth, whips, walking sticks, umbrella handles, buttons, brooches, pierced and inlaid wood, book binding, tubes, 
chemical taps and pipes, photographic baths, battery cells, philosophical instruments, waterproof fabrics, sheets and other articles of surgical purposes, and for works of art in general. Nowadays we might consider this an early warning sign against the damage of plastics on the world, but if you look at the history of the first synthetic polymers, they were invented to save the natural world. In 1869, the American scientist John Wesley Hyatt invented a celluloid inspired by a New York firm's offer of $10,000 uh, for anyone who could provide a substitute for ivory. By treating cellulose derived from cotton fibre with camphor, Hyatt discovered a plastic that could be crafted into a variety of shapes and made uh, to imitate natural substances like tortoise shell, horn and ivory. These advances in plastics were revolutionary as this was the first time that manufacturing was not constrained by the limits of nature, it was instead what we as humans could create. In the early days of these wonder materials, they helped rather than hampered nature. The Parkesine comb in the V&A collection, go back to it there, I think it's very beautiful, um, perfectly reflects this moment. And it's a reminder that material innovation is key when battling with the issues that we now stand in front. Another object that I thought could speak to this moment and that we might be able to learn from uh, is this chair by uh, Morrison Co. And I picked this one to look at the question uh, of pow and power of longevity. The armchair is, is part of the Sussex range of rush seated furniture that the company Morris & Co produced. And it is thought that the artist um, Ford Maddox Brown suggested the addition of the arms to this particular chair. Um, apart from that, there isn't a specific designer of the Sussex range. This example is from 1870. Um, and the Sussex range uh, is, most, is the most widely known furniture that William Morris uh, made for Morris & Co and remained in production for over 50 years. So this was from 1870, but it was actually still advertised in the company catalogues in the 1910s. The wallpaper next to it uh, that William Morris created, which is called Vine, uh, is from 1873 and the Morris wallpapers are still produced to this day. Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, Morris wrote a quote about uh, the vine wallpaper and his nature wallpaper in general. He said, not better to be reminded, however, simply of the close vine trellises which keep out the sun than having to count day after day a few shamreel bows of flowers casting shamreel shadows on your walls with little hint of anything beyond Covent Garden in them. So this is a clear dig at the fake flowers and greenery that was found at the London market at that time. And he thought his wallpaper was to be preferred every time. In regards to longevity, it's also very interesting to think that William Morris um, of the arts and crafts moment, um, movement was involved with a very early design uh, of the V&A, the refreshment rooms. The three refreshment rooms that are now named after the makers of them uh, were the first refreshment rooms in the world that existed in the museum. Uh, and they were there to create another experience for our visitors than to just go and see the collection. But that refreshment room that Morris designed uh, next to Pointer and Gamble uh, still exists to this day. So 150 years on, those rooms are still there and still used by our visitors on a daily basis. So uh, William Morris did know something about longevity. I'm moving forward in time to the 18, sorry, not the 1860s, to the 1960s. So if the two earlier examples of the comb and the um, uh, armchair and wallpaper uh, can be seen to represent the nascence of an environmental movement and as a reaction against depleting natural resources and against the fast pace of industrialization. This was, of course, William Morris's philosophy, a return back to older ideals of making, making based on craft rather than industry. This example is a reflection on the fast pace of consumption following the Second World War. Rather than being designed to be long lasting, this object is designed to be disposable. But with, but with little consequence for the environment. The chair, or chair thing as it's called, was designed by Peter Murdoch uh, in the 1960s um, here in the UK. 
and the chair captures the look and ethos of the pop art movement. But rather than utilizing the then very popular polypropylene, this simple form was created from a single piece of die cut card. Over 76,000 pieces were sold in 1967 and they were retailing for less than one pound. But due to its disposability, few examples now exist and we are lucky to still have two in the collection. As we move forward in time uh, and closer to the 21st century, we find that the collection start to look towards reuse as this poster by the body shop shows. Uh, the company, as you probably all know, was set up in, the uh, um, 1975, in 1975 by Anita Roddick. Uh, and it was there to uh, created to s uh, sell natural products for an increasingly environmentally aware consumer. Its products were not tested on animals uh, and were produced without harming the environment. And this poster designed by Richard Browning was uh, produced in 1990 to advertise Body Shop's scheme to refill its toiletry containers rather than selling products in new ones. It features the text, once is not enough, and in keeping with the organization's ethos, is also printed on recycled paper. In a similar vein, uh, we have uh, this chair by Jane Atfield from 1991. It is made entirely of recycled plastic bottles that once contained shampoo, washing up liquid or suntan lotion, for example. The bottles were collected in community collection points, cleaned and then chipped. The board was made from these chips by pressing and heating the plastic so they bonded together. And you can still see the different colours of the bottles and even some fragments of text on this chair. The shape and form of the chair are simplified and its structure relies on the strength of the panels, which are just simply screwed together. The chair became very emblematic of the environmentally friendly design movement at this time in the early 1990s. But if Atfield's proposition was to reuse recycled plastics and make that obvious in the design of the chair, in the 2010s the Italian design duo Forma Fantasma, that's based in Amsterdam, revisited old ways of making plastics for its botanic range of vessels, which you can see here. The designers researched natural polymers, such as shellac and copal, in an attempt to assess the changing attitudes to plastics over the past century. The natural textures and plant-like forms are a reference to the animal and vegetable origins of the polymers used for this project, just like the, poly uh, just like the parkesine that I showed you earlier. With Botanica, Studio Forma Fantasma offers a new perspective on plasticity, reinterpreting centuries-old technology lost beneath the impeccable surface of mass production, so this is not plastic as we now know it. Botanica does not intend to offer practical suggestions for materials which can be produced and used on industrial scale. It is simply an exploration of attitudes to materials, but nevertheless a reminder to us that the past might offer solutions to deal with present issues. Botanica is clearly a research project, not necessarily aimed at the market, and as such it might help impact thinking, but what about affecting the bigger picture and more far-reaching systemic change? These examples become small drops uh, in an ocean which is much larger than we can ever imagine uh, when we look at design manufacturing systems or the design of manufacturing systems. And this is something that the Fairphone uh, and this is, the Fairphone is in the middle in a box with all its packaging around it. Um, it's a smartphone with an open source Android operating system with user interfaces by Kwame uh, Corp. It is the first smartphone to be manufactured with a view to making the electronics industry fairer and more sustainable. Beginning as a campaign in 2010 by designer Basman Abel, Fairphone was founded initially as a non-profit advocacy group to raise awareness of the relationship between conflict minerals and electronic goods. Smartphones use up to 60 different minerals in their manufacture, including tantalum, tungsten, tin and gold, which are often extracted from ore mined, uh, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Rich in natural resources, raw materials, this country uh, export, uh, exports 50% of its um, uh, Mine, uh, mined materials to China, where the majority of smartphone parts are made. 
the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo is obviously, as you might all know, quite politically unstable and has an ongoing civil war and endemic <coughs> corruption, which has led to many mines being controlled by armed groups and with un inhumane and unsustainable working conditions. At the VNA, we displayed the Fairphone in 2014 in order to highlight the lack of general understanding regarding the provenance of materials and the materials for a consumer product, ob consumer product or object that most of us carry around in our pocket. Another system change which I wanted to uh, promote through this object um, was distributed manufacture. In recent years, this has become a method for addressing the increased issues and pollutions of long distance shipping. This is a digitally fabricated three-legged stool designed by David and Johnny Steiner as part of the Open Desk collection. Open Desk calls themselves a global platform for local making. Their website can be used to download, make and buy mainly workspace furniture. The digital files can be downloaded and then made locally on demand anywhere in the world. The stool is part of Open Desk's open making ethos, whereby the disconnection between designers and manufacturers is challenged. The platform brings together three components, the maker, who makes money from manufacture, designer, who gets global distribution, and the customer, who has the choice to pick uh, from open source designs and where they want to make those open source designs. This particular model prototyped the use of Lego style uh, friction fastenings so that there's no glue and no screws used for the assembly of this stool. Open Desk represents an alternative to current mass manufacturing models and mass produced products. It champions the decentralized systems where products can be produced in any workshop, in this case using CNC cutting machines. So to round off, I picked this object uh, to represent what I see as one of the main factors to fi finding ourselves in this uncanny place of anxiety over our planet. In the 20th century, consumption has come to replace other pastimes. And what we consume and how we consume have increasingly come to represent us and our identities. This bag, produced uh, in collaboration with Barbara Kruger for the now closed Barcelona design store Vincent, perfectly sums up this tendency. I shop, therefore I am. It's a reproduction of Barbara Kruger's 1987 artwork uh, with the same image. It's a radical take on the famous proposition, I think, therefore I am, by the 17th century French philosopher Descartes. I would argue, like Kruger, that if we were to revert to Descartes' proposition, we might start finding a meaningful way forward and one that addressed our concerns for our coexistence with nature and the planet. So as a shorthand, um, and maybe this is something uh, that we can continue to discuss after this, uh, I have put together some conclusions from the objects that I picked from the collection. So through this tour, brief tour of the V&A collection, we might uh, take the following learnings. Material innovation that consider the environment is a potential way forward. Longevity of design products can definitely help in the way that we address this current situation. Disposability, when it's ecologically safe, is another potential answer. Reuse should always be considered. New systems manufacture might offer new uh, possibilities. And a new attitude to consumption is something that I think that we can all contribute to this. The museum is a vital space for this debate and a continued discussion around this subject matter. And it's one in which you are all invited to take part. So maybe that's what we could do now.